like good afternoon friends a video uh, session i am i at the outset i would like to apologize for not being there physically here for this meeting but i am missing out the excitement of this wonderful meeting organized by dr bansi and dr bharat sabu and i thank uh, dr manoj for inviting me to be here in uh, to give this talk on saroglitazar realizing its true potential so saroglitazar has uh, become a drug which is being more often used and be discussing about that in the next few minutes so if you look at uh, the scenario of diabetes and the prevalence of dyslipidemia among, amongst patients with diabetes we find that more than 70% of patients with diabetes have dyslipidemia and this is called as the atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia and if you look at indians the scenario is slightly even different with more than 90% of indians having some form of dyslipidemia if you look at males 85.5% of males and 97% of females with diabetes have dyslipidemia which would amount to more than 55 million people with uh, diabetes having dyslipidemia in india so this is a uh, a huge burden uh, of dyslipidemia amongst patients with diabetes and we if you look at the pathogenesis of atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia we see that insulin resistance is a key key factor uh, causing the dyslipidemia and as we know with with the higher levels of insulin there is there is a effect on the liver with increased triglycerides increased free fatty acids because of the insulin resistance at the at the level of the adipose tissue causing uh, increased free fatty acids in circulation the liver is again putting out uh, putting in most of these uh, triglycerides into vldl and then there's exchange of these triglycerides uh, from the vldl with the uh, hdl and with ldl leading to uh, triglyceride rich hdl particles which are again uh, which are again not as protective as the as the normal hdl particles and then again in the ldl with the increased triglyceride content in the ldl leading to the formation of small dense ldl in addition to the dyslipidemia we also see that there is a high prevalence of of non alcoholic fatty liver disease or now it is now being called as the metabolism associated fatty liver disease because that encompasses the entire spectrum and uh, what we see in this is that uh, there is a high prevalence of uh, no, uh, of nafold amongst patients with diabetes and if you look at patients with nafold also a higher proportion of them have diabetes as compared to the general population you could say that uh, almost uh, 22% of uh, uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease and and 43% of uh, individuals with nash have have uh, diabetes indicating that much higher prevalence of diabetes amongst these groups and uh, these the complex interaction between non alcoholic fatty liver disease visceral adiposity and insulin resistance make it difficult to distinguish the precise mechanisms underlying the increased risk of diabetes among patients with non alcoholic fatty liver disease so there is a bidirectional relationship you can say between uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease and diabetes and if you look at the spectrum of non alcoholic fatty liver disease we see that uh, it progresses from uh, just the benign fat accumulation to the development of uh, uh, to the development of uh, inflammation uh, and then uh, setting in of fibrosis which progresses on to the to the development of cirrhosis and also the development of hepatocellular carcinoma so in the early stages regression is possible while in the later stages uh, i think the regression becomes much less uh, much less possible and uh, if you look at the risk factors if you look at the risk factors for for the development of non alcoholic fatty liver disease clearly obesity uh type type 2 diabetes dyslipidemia and uh, stand out as very important factors and then we have other environmental factors dysbiosis antibiotic use and also genetics playing an important role uh some of the genes that have been identified recently are uh, pnp la3 and several others which have which are being studied now if you look at the global burden of also nafl we are seeing that there is a there's a very significant increase globally in the burden of uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease this uh, cartoon depicts the uh, the rise in the prevalence from in the last uh, say 2 to 3 decades and uh, you could see that across the globe this is uh, this is happening and uh, if, uh, there is a bidirectional relationship between non alcoholic fatty liver disease and diabetes that is diabetes worsens the uh, worsens the non alcoholic fatty liver disease in turns it, it increases the risk of progression to uh, progression to the ad higher advanced stages of uh, advanced stages of steatohepatitis fibrosis 
and uh, similarly the presence of non alcoholic fatty liver disease has a has a impact on diabetes also in when it is present in patient in people with pre diabetes it increases the progression to diabetes in patient in patients with diabetes it increases the risk of development of cardiovascular disease and once again because of the fact that it increases uh, the oxidative stress increases the adipokines and endo endoplasmic reticulum stress and all these factors playing a, a role in the progression of uh, diabetes towards the development of complications so therefore we need a molecule which addresses uh, all these factors that is uh, not only is uh, is good for the diabetic dyslipidemia but also for the non alcoholic fatty liver disease so this is what we are looking at and uh, what we have today for this if you look at the available uh, uh, pharmacotherapy uh, probably all the other agents like if you see for diabetes we have agents like metformin su's sglt2 inhibitors the whole uh, spectrum we have here uh, and if you uh, and which of these drugs are acting on the insulin resistance which is the root cause of diabetic dyslipidemia probably not not except the tzds and and metformin uh, the others do not directly address the issue of insulin resistance and uh, similarly uh, if you're looking at statins or uh, uh, or phenofibrate also they they, uh, they do not uh, uh, truly address the insulin resistance so therefore we need a drug which has a, a drug like uh, saroglitazar which has a, 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 a action on both the alpha and and uh, ppar gamma agonism and uh, th this is the only approved drug in india for non alcoholic fatty liver disease in nash it was initially approved for the use in in september 2013 for atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia and later now for uh, in 2020 it got approved for the use in non alcoholic fatty liver disease now if you quickly look at uh, the timelines we see that uh, the drug was identified in 2001 and went through all the preclinical uh, evaluation the clinical uh, uh, phase 1 phase 2 evaluation and phase 3 evaluation till 2013 when it was approved for approved by the dcgi for use in uh, atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia and then subsequently there have been uh, other studies which have been carried out phase 4 studies have been carried out we have studies in the us also which have been uh, carried out uh, with uh, saroglitazar and uh, in 2020 the dcg approval for new indications that, that is for non alcoholic fatty liver disease in nash uh, and also for type one, uh, type 2 diabetes so these are the new approvals in 2020 and if you look at uh, the mechanism action it has the action of uh, increase uh, of uh, agonism at the alpha uh, ppar alpha uh, receptors leading to fatty acid uptake fatty acid oxidation increasing the apo a1 and hdl levels decreasing the vldl triglycerides decreasing the apo c3 and anti inflammatory effects while the effects on the ppar gamma agonism lead to increase in insulin sensitivity beta cell improvement in beta cell function increased free fatty acid uptake increase in adiponectin secretion and anti and uh, all the anti inflammatory effects so together we see that uh, both these effects lead to uh, activation of genes leading to improvement in lipid metabolism and also the genes uh, responsible for uh, glucose metabolism and uh, so we see improvement in lipids but uh, in a modest improvement in glycemic control reduction in inflammation and probably we have to look at how this fares in terms of reducing cardiovascular events in the long term uh, follow up of these uh, of patients who are using these mo this molecule so uh, saroglitazar improves glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity indices as has been seen in different studies this is a study which was uh, looking at a four month uh, use of saroglitazar and improvement in the insulin sensitivity and glucose uh, metabolism parameters now an interesting review from uh, uh, professor pender call et al in 2019 in cardiovascular diabetes diabetology has uh, reviewed 18 studies of uh, cl clinical studies of saroglitazar with more than 5800 pay patients and they have uh, uh, summarized that there's a reduction in triglycerides to the extent of 45 to 62 percent reduction in the non-HDL cholesterol by 21 to 36 percent small dense LDL by about 20.3 percent reduction H HbA1c reduction was also to the tune of 0.7 to 1.6 percent and ALT reductions uh, to the tune of 28 to 67 percent now coming to non-alcoholic fatty liver so that probably summarizes most of the benefits that we see on atherogenic diabetes dyslipidemia now coming to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease if you look at the management approach the approach is mainly towards lifestyle 
modification with diet and weight, diet control and weight reduction, managing the comorbidities like obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery also has some role in, in reducing the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, if you look at the various guidelines uh, and the, the, what they have suggested about lifestyle approach, this is summarized here. Uh, all of them suggest about 50, 500 to 1,000 kilocalorie energy deficit, uh, you know, leading to a weight loss of about five, uh, half to 1 kg uh, every week. And uh, they suggest that a 7 to 10% weight loss is a target of lifestyle in interventions to improve uh, the steatosis and fibrosis. But this is a... Uh, a difficult uh, proposition. Cha it is a challenge to maintain the weight loss over a period of time, but sustained weight loss of uh, can can lead to uh, of more than ten percent can lead to the regression of fibrosis. Now, if you look at the role of saruclitazar in the treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, this was a randomized double-blind phase two trial, which was carried out uh, uh, with uh, in the, in the US with 104 for, uh, in different sites in the US with 104 patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, treated with saroglitazor 1, 1 and 2 milligrams, 1, 2 and 4 milligrams uh, and compared with placebo. And uh, for a duration of 16 weeks, the primary change that was, they were looking at was change in the efficacy and points in the full, uh, full analysis set population from baseline to week 16. That is a four-month treatment. And uh, you could see that there was, uh, with 4 mg of saroglitazar, there was an improvement in the ALT levels and absolute change in liver fat content. Percentage of liver fat reduction by 10% happened in about 55% of the patients. And uh, by more than 30% reduction, liver fat uh, was seen in 41% of the patients. So this is uh, another biopsy-driven study, in a phase 3 study from India, which... Uh, uh, looked at the effectiveness of uh, saroglitazar in, in NASH in patients. Uh, this is uh, showing that there was an improvement in the uh, uh, NAS score by more than two, was observed in 52% of patients uh, without worsening of fibrosis at, at uh, 52 weeks, that is one year of treatment. So another uh, uh, study which was looking at uh, the use of saroglitazar in real-world patients with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with or without diabetes, with compens including compensated cirrhosis, and uh, which had 112 patients enrolled. Uh, and uh, uh, these patients uh, were treated with saroglitazar for 52 weeks. Uh, what we see is a, a improvement in the fibrosis grade uh, and, uh, and and as you can see, the improvement was seen in uh, patients uh, with who were in uh, F2 and F3 uh, stages with at 24 and 52 weeks, you could see a significant improvement in the uh, degree of face, uh, fibrosis uh, on the elastography. So quickly looking at uh, the comparison between different uh, uh, pharmacotherapies that are approved for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we see that uh, uh, saroglitazor is the one which has a significant effect on insulin sensitivity apart from pioglitazone and it is approved for treatment for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, brings about a significant improvement in the, uh, in the NAS score and also uh, has uh, no significant adverse effects. The, uh, the INA cell in 2022 has recommended uh, 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 saroglitazor as a as a as a treatment for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and uh, they have uh, uh, highlighted the reduction in the liver fat and enzymes and the reduction in uh, and the biopsy evidence shown for with the use of these drugs. Uh, the Lipid Association of India recommendations and the RSSDI recommendations on diabetic dyslipidemia has also mentioned about uh, about the use of saroglitazar in atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So in summary, I would say that uh, in atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia, the Asian Indian phenotype carries a higher risk of insulin resistance. Uh, presence of insulin resistance amongst obese children leads to early age development of metabolic complications, insulin resistance is linked to the development of type 2 diabetes, obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, dyslipidemia. And in India, 
elevated triglycerides contribute to, to a higher prevalence of heterogenic diabetic dyslipidemia. And there is, uh, uh, and probably saroglitazar is the only molecule which uh, has a dual action on both insulin resistance and hypertriglyceride in patients with type 2 diabetes. In clinical uh, studies, the significant, uh, the beneficial effect of saroglitazar in on tri reducing triglycerides has been uh, shown uh, through several different studies. And if you look at uh, the its role in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I would say that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is, is uh, widely prevalent amongst patients with diabetes and uh, uh, the FIB4 and FibroScan are key parameters to check uh, further progression of, of uh, fibrosis, lifestyle modification, weight reduction, the first line management, but sustained weight reduction is a major challenge and drugs like saroglitazar uh, are, is the, probably the only approved medication to treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in India, which can reduce liver enzymes, liver fat and fibrosis score as well. So thank you all for the patient hearing. I once again congratulate uh, the organizers for the excellent uh, event that is organized and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.